thank you for coming. So it is about community hospitals. And uh, the original title was, and I don't know if Stephen's going to stick to that, is do we really need community hospitals? Because I, I actually have had some discussions with people say we should be downsizing community hospitals, and maybe that'll come up. Pardon me? It's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. Well, you get a chance to defend yourself. So we're going to uh, uh, acknowledge our sponsors, Accenture and Baxter. Thank them very much. There we go. And Janet Stephen has no spending power at all, but you have lots, so just remember who your sponsors were today. <laughs> Stephen Lewis and Janet Davis. So Janet, before we begin, you, you, you had, you're, feel a little misled by this? Well, yes, I was uh, telling him earlier that I actually thought it was going to be the other Stephen Lewis. So my question, my first question was going to be, so can we have a good discussion about HIV AIDS in Africa? And uh, much to my chagrin, uh, uh, Stephen said no. <laughs> well, we could. And if, 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 you, if any of you read Atlantic Magazine, the men in the audience, if you want to cringe, read about the adult male circumcision campaign going on in Swaziland, because it does reduce transmission. And all these 18-year-old boys are being dragged in by their peers to have the job done. And as an adult, I don't think I'd recommend it. <laughs> anyway, delighted that you're here. And my job is to uh, tease out of Janet some observations about how the system is working, and in particular, the role of the so-called community hospital. But you know, I'm a simple guy from Saskatchewan. I see your hospital has 900 beds, thousands of staff, high-powered physicians, a lot of teaching. So what's the difference between your community hospital and an academic health science center? Well, actually, that's a good question. I was thinking about it uh, last night. And when I got over my conspiracy theory about, uh, you know, you put, uh, uh, you, you, it's a way of, of putting hospitals in a lesser category by calling them community hospitals, uh, I thought to myself, in healthcare, we have a habit of it's nice to put everything in nice, neat little boxes because it's just easy to qualify, and it's particularly good if we want to fund them. So we have one set of hospitals that are funded one way, academic medical centers, and I've spent most of my career in academic centers. But I think of Trillium. I mean, you're, as you're right, we have 900 beds, uh, over 5,000 staff, 500 physicians. Uh, we are now fully affiliated with the University of Toronto. 47% of our work is tertiary quaternary. Uh, and uh, um, I say to myself, well, what are we then? Is it a community hospital? Is it an academic center? Or why do we actually even use those terms anymore? I think, I think the right term is that there are hospitals of the community, uh, where the community takes a very strong interest in them. But I'm less inclined now to, uh, uh, to try and view hospitals being classified on things like an academic medical center, a community hospital, uh, whatever you might have it. So would you care to put a, a dollar figure on how much the term is costing you? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, let me see who's in the audience first. <laughs> um, no, but I think uh, I would say it, it is a way to, uh, uh, to classify hospitals that does uh, provide for less funding for some than others. Now, I'm not saying academic centers, uh, uh, certainly what we consider to be the academic health sciences centers, uh, do a lot of, uh, uh, they have a huge research uh, agenda, which, uh, uh, which um, the other hospitals, I'll just say others, uh, don't have. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there's some uh, uh, necessary funding support for that. But I think simply to say an academic center has a certain level of funding and everybody else has something else is kind of a simplistic way of doing things. Now let's, <clears throat> let's look at the, the upside of this, which is that you're, you're fair distance from, let's say, University Avenue. You're not caught up in all of that. You're a, yeah. a, 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 a municipality removed. So you've got an opportunity to do some things, perhaps, that you can't do in a more complicated environment, not that yours isn't complicated. And, and one of those, uh, ostensibly, is efficiency. That you can relate to the community services better, you can get people out, you can reduce your alternate levels of care days. Uh, but that takes a culture, right? Tell, tell me how that's gone. Uh, how, uh, does, does, is the culture of your hospital 
doing what the system has recommended for a long time, which is really trying to help the system do better upstream and make it the place of last resort rather than first resort and make the community services more efficient? Well, I think it's, yes, I actually do. I mean, one of the, the things that, um, because we are a hospital, and I will say again, of the community, there are strong linkages between uh, these types of hospitals and community agencies. So you just, uh, because you're so linked to the public, uh, you're constantly dealing with, uh, uh, with those agencies. So the connections are perhaps uh, uh, more visible. But I would say in things like ALC, uh, the rates are probably higher. Uh, uh, the, um, the activity is certainly uh, 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 tremendously high. I mean, the thing that, that hospitals like, uh, uh, like mine have, or a, a number of, uh, of other so-called community hospitals, is a huge, huge volume, and there are, they tend to be in high growth areas. So you look at the donut, for example, the 905 uh, uh, area of Toronto, and the, the growth in those communities is huge. So. Uh, the volumes. I mean, I look at, for instance, our ER volumes this over Christmas this year are up 13% over last year. Uh, so huge volumes, and it represents, I think, the growth in the community. So you do try different things. You're right. You're not uh, you're not constrained uh, by some of the, uh, uh, I guess, some of the uh, uh, the more uh, traditional approaches maybe that academic centers have. Uh, so you do try out different things. And among those different things might be uh, a, a quicker uh, adoption of quality and safety measures. Uh, I know it's paradoxical because many people think that academic centers are the leading edge there, but the evidence wouldn't suggest that they're any better than anybody else at doing this. And Canada is probably a little slower than some other countries in getting on the bandwagon. So tell me what you found when you arrived at Trillium and what have you done to orient the culture towards a quality and safety agenda? Oh, well, Trillium, I mean, I, I said when I left Ontario back in 2003 that I was going to go off to Vancouver and do my work there and then eventually fade off into the sunset and kayak out into the Pacific. I, and I really didn't have any intention of coming back to Ontario, not that I, I didn't enjoy it. I mean, I did most of my growing up here. But when they called me about Trillium, I said, yeah, I'll think I'll come back for Trillium. And why? Because they, they do things differently. And it is the organization, uh, and it's the people in it. I think one of the things that Trillium has done extremely well, and it's, uh, it's, it's certainly started long before I got there, is a real focus on the people. So they link quality to the people and say, OK, if you have a quality working life, you can drive quality patient care through that. So not to say that we don't have all the measures, and you can look on our website and, uh, uh, and look at our quality and safety plan and the, uh, uh, the quality measures that we focus on, but we also equally focus on the quality of our working life of our people. We're non-unionized. All the hospitals actually in Mississauga Halton are non-unionized hospitals. Uh, uh, but there's a very strong focus on saying how can we make sure that our people uh, we develop them, we devote a lot of money, and we do get criticized on occasion for spending more of our budget on uh, education and development than perhaps is, uh, uh, is the average. Uh, but we, uh, we end up with, uh, we're an employer of choice. We probably have maybe eight or ten vacancies uh, at our hospital. Our turnovers are some of the lowest in the province. Sick time is very low. Uh, and although we have a hierarchy, the hierarchy I mean, it's for the purposes of, well, you've got to put an org chart on your website and explain, you know, there's a CEO and how does this thing cascade down or up in the organization. But that's really just for the purposes of saying you have an org chart. It's pretty much a, a, quite a flat structure and uh, uh, people feel that they, um, that they own the organization and so they drive quality pretty quickly. And I'd use the example, it's been uh, published, but we, we looked at transfer of care at the bedside. And this came out as a, a, a manager on one of our units identified that at change of shift, all the nurses would go into the nursing station and they'd be talking about the, reading the charts and, uh, and uh, listening to report. And during that time, you could have patients deteriorate. So then, then the nurses who are taking over uh, at the shift would go back out and look at their uh, patients and say, well, wait a minute, that's not quite the Mr. Jones I heard about in report. And so they came up with this idea. They said, well, we're going to transfer care at the bedside. 
Uh, and so uh, it takes a few minutes to transfer the two nurses, the one leaving, the one coming on, actually in front of the patient, transfer the patient's care. Uh, it means the nurses come in early. They came in, just said, no, it's the thing to do. Uh, and uh, we started it in that unit, and in less than a year, it, it went across the whole hospital. And our rate of, uh, of uh, things like patient falls, improved patient satisfaction, all of those things came up. And it was something that people said it's the thing to do, and we went ahead and did it. So where does that come from? Uh, there's this debate about bottom-up, top-down, and the debate in the Canadian way is usually to say both. Uh, <laughs> so wh where, 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 did, where did this, who lit the spark? Uh, and how, how, who spread the fire? Well, I actually, I mean, I think it was everybody. Uh, um, there is a, a philosophy at Trillium that talks about a thousand and one leaders. Uh, and so uh, uh, it was top down. I don't think there's any doubt that the, uh, the senior team uh, uh, created a very strong message and the board did through its strategy. I mean, we have a, a five strategic priorities and investing in our people is a big one for us. Uh, and so uh, it creates an environment where people uh, feel that, they're, that they have, one, we respect their contribution, and two, they almost have an obligation to make a contribution to improving things. Uh, but it also came from the, uh, uh, from the, the bottom, sideways, and, and, and every way. Maybe, maybe we should uh, do a study to find out exactly. Yes, more research <laughs> where, is needed. Where, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly, especially here. <laughs> Let's talk about physician leadership. You know, you hear this over and over and over again that we have sort of circled this issue in Canada. Yeah. We have this group of quasi-independent contractors most of the time working under a collective agreements that were established in the 60s but don't work anymore and everybody knows it but nobody can change them. So how do you get physicians to lead, fully participate mm -hmm. in the agenda of the hospital? Uh, what's your accountability structure? And what do you do about things like variations in practice, either on the quality aspect of it or the efficiency aspect yeah. of it? Well, I mean, it's not a, it's not a straightforward issue, uh, undoubtedly. Now, one of the things Trillium did do is uh, we have a co-management model at the organization. So starting at the top for a moment, we have a VP clinical uh, 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 patient quality and safety. Uh, and our VP nursing, it's combined into one position, and we have a VP medical. All of our clinical programs report jointly to those people. Uh, and at each program level, so if it's medical, surgical, neuro, whatever it might be, we, we have a co-management lead, so a medical director and an operational director. Those people are paid to do those jobs. We have job descriptions for them, and they report up through the management structure of the organization. So we, we hold them accountable, and we do annual performance appraisals uh, on them the same as we would uh, on the physician leaders, uh, the same way uh, as we would do with, uh, uh, with our operational leaders. Uh, and so uh, that was specifically to, uh, because our physicians said they wanted to be more involved in the operation and management of the organization. Uh, so, I mean, it's not enough just to say you've got this structure uh, and you, uh, you create an accountability structure, but we also, uh, uh, we actually engaged in uh, um, uh, uh, a program with Rotman, we're in it right now, uh, where we've, uh, uh, we've got a training program for our medical and operational uh, uh, directors on management. So, I mean, we did the, uh, uh, the, uh, the CMA in those programs, but we said we wanted to go one step more. So we have this program, it's over a period of a year, and we're going through and actually talking about things. It's not enough to say you're a medical director. You actually know about budgeting. What is it all about? Uh, do you understand HR issues? Because there are, a, are HR issues. What about analyzing and looking at data on variation, those sorts of things? Uh, uh, so, uh, and how do you deal with conflict resolution and, and all of this stuff? So it's turning out to be uh, uh, extremely successful. Uh, not that we don't have, uh, uh, have challenges, but I have to say that it's, uh, uh, that it's working remarkably well. Now on the quality, uh, we've tried to push quality through the whole organization, although we have a separate department that's trying to provide us with, uh, with some uh, uh, centralized expertise. Uh, we've taken the view that everybody has to own quality, so if you create too big of a quality department, 
you have everybody saying it's like, uh, it's like patient concerns or any of that. That's their job. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. Send it off to that department. So we, uh, we have a, a medical uh, a lead in quality, which we think is important, and we, we pay that uh, uh, clinician. Uh, and uh, that individual uh, uh, brings all of the medical quality issues to the MAC. We've had a board quality committee, uh, uh, actually I'm looking at Graham uh, Scott here and Maureen Quigley, uh, went through our, our board went through a, a board renewal maybe six years ago. Uh, and one of the things they came out with as a result of that is to create a board quality monitoring committee. So they have had that, uh, that committee in place for some time and they, uh, they've driven a board quality plan. They get regular reports on quality performance in the organization. They set a performance indicators. The MAC uh, uh, reports up through them uh, on quality issues. And we actually have a, a job uh, the job descriptions, for lack of a better word, of, of both groups of, uh, of individuals like MAC, like our Board Quality Monitoring Committee, as well as individuals, all have a quality, uh, quality dimension within their, uh, uh, within their uh, uh, description. And we actually create annual goals and objectives and then hold people accountable for them. So it is important, I think, to, um, to drive uh, um, you have to align the whole organization around quality. You can't just say, well, it's kind of nebulous quality. You've got to be very specific. So for example, our board, two years ago, a uh, year and a half ago, we brought in uh, Ross Baker. I came into our board and uh, we had a big discussion, the board uh, uh, did, on um, what were important quality measures. So we looked at some of the stuff Remember Don Berwick when he issued that RFP when he was going for surgery and he said, you know, I don't want you to kill me and I don't want you to uh, cause me unnecessary pain and I don't want you to uh, harm me and I don't want you to uh, cause me uh, 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 needless weight. So we took that framework and we said, okay, we're going to set some uh, board indicators as a result of that. So uh, uh, obviously uh, no needless death would be HSMR. Uh, then we looked at things. We picked, okay, we're going to uh, look at patient satisfaction. Uh, we're going to look at things like um, um, uh, hospital-acquired uh, 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 pressure ulcers. I mean, it could be anything, but we picked it. Well, we've gone from about 22% down to 4 in hospital-acquired. Why? Because we picked that, and everybody in the organization understands that that's a quality measure. Uh, and then we, we did some work with the, uh, uh, with the province and uh, spent some time in the NHS looking at their releasing time to care activities. And you go to any of our units in the hospital now and we have these uh, um, uh, safety crosses. This is pretty low tech. It's a piece of paper in the shape of a cross. And each one of the squares on the cross has a particular performance uh, uh, indicator that they look at, a safety quality indicator. Just tick off every day whether something's happened. You can go to any unit and say how many falls that day, how many acquired uh, pressure ulcers, how many this, and it's driven the organization around certain things. I mean, we picked certain indicators, but I've, I've said to people, uh, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't matter so much what the indicator is. It, it matters that it's important to you and you understand why you've selected it, and then you just drive it. And I think that's the challenge that we have uh, in the system, I just go nuts every time I look at our, um, our accountability agreement, which has got appendices that are five feet high and indicators coming out of your eyeballs. And, and if everything's important, nothing's important. It just gets to be too much. So I say pick a few, look at them, and drive it. And I think that's where we've been successful. <clears throat> Let's talk about the system and the broader system. You've worked in BC, Alberta, yeah. and Ontario. Yeah. Um, one is still regionalized, one used to be regionalized, and one is <laughs> quasi-regionalized. It's not a tough quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how does the, what, is, what does the advent of the Lynn mean for a, a hospital like yours? Uh, has it made your life better? Has it made the system better? As a work in progress, how do you think it's going? And uh, do you think that the right opposition leader will follow through on his promise to dump them? Oh, uh, well, I think... I just threw that last one in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I am a fan of, um, of 
better integration. I mean, uh, when I left Ontario in 2003, I, uh, you know, having gone through the first uh, wave and rolled out the first wave of regionalization in Alberta, uh, I, uh, I was very disappointed that Ontario was not going to a more integrated approach. So uh, I moved, uh, that was one of the reasons for moving to British Columbia. Uh, coming back, I had, I had hoped that the regionalization here under, under the Lynn uh, uh, framework uh, would have been a better than it was. And, and I want to qualify it. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we've allowed it to be what it can be. I mean, I, I think that the, the challenge is and integration is, integration is strategic. And I, I think what we've ended up having here is something that's more operational. So the strategy piece is still missing. It is missing. Uh, we've got all of these more, more accountability stuff now. So for instance, while it used to be, I'm just picking numbers out of the hat, you, you would say you had to submit your budget to government by January. Well, now you have to submit it in October because it's got to go to the LIN and then the LIN reviews it and then they've got to turn around and give it to the government. So it's become a, another level uh, as opposed to, I, I think, more strategic integration. I am though more now leaning to, uh, towards saying, what do you have to do to integrate? Uh, because I think in this country, and it may not be just this country, this is the one I'm most familiar with, but we have taken, uh, uh, unfortunately, the view that structures are going to solve our problems. So we'll put in place a LIN, we'll put in place a, a regional health authority, we'll put in place whatever it is that's in place in Alberta. Uh, but it's all about structures without saying, well, but what are you trying to achieve with these structures? And if you're really trying to achieve integration, you don't need structures to do that. I mean, what about incentives? I mean, I can understand on one hand in some of my more uh, uh, warped days is to say why they got rid of some of the stuff they did in Alberta because they created regions that wouldn't talk to each other. I mean, we have in this province, we have 14 LINs that pride themselves on being different. Uh, now, in some ways, that's good uh, because there is regional variation. Uh, but you'd say, well, isn't the funding system a funding system? Aren't quality measures quality measures? Uh, uh, and so I think, I think we have to spend more time understanding what it takes to get integration and cooperation and coordination, not just saying, I'm going to put in place or get rid of uh, uh, you know, if, if, the, uh, if the, uh, uh, the conservatives get in, and, and uh, I certainly, uh, Tim Hudak has made no bones about the fact that he wants to get rid of the lens, but what are you going to replace it with? What, what is it you're going to do that's going to get the system uh, more integrated, more coordinated, include how are you going to bring the physicians uh, uh, into this piece as well? So is, <clears throat> where do you think the LINs, or at least your LIN, I was going to them all, uh, have had the biggest positive impact? Do people talk to each other more? Does money move around to the need more easily? Or is it still early days? Well, I think it's early days to see money moving around too much. But I mean, in our LIN, uh, we've been quite successful, for instance, on the ALC uh, uh, issue. and. Um, um, seeing Vita here, uh, one of the uh, things that our Lynn did pretty early on was to create a, a Lynn wide committee. I co chaired it with the CCAC, uh, and we developed a whole strategy for looking at ALC, not just ALC and acute care. That was the first priority because it was a big mess. It still is an issue, but you look at our Lynn, we probably have the lowest rate of ALC in the province. Um, but then we said, but there's ALC in, in long-term care. There's ALC in rehab. There's ALC all over the place. Uh, and so uh, I'm not sure, uh, quite honestly, that we would have gotten that if the, uh, uh, if the LIN hadn't been there. We've done some clinical moves, too. Uh, uh, recently, we um, consolidated all vascular uh, work at Trillium, uh, and we are in the process of consolidating all thoracic uh, oncological surgery at Credit Valley. So that was bringing uh, uh, people together uh, to discuss based upon, we developed some principles about, you know, what's the best evidence uh, on this, what's best for the patient, these sort of things. So we were able to do that. Uh, and I don't think uh, uh, that would have been possible uh, uh, without the LIN or without some structure or, or not even structure, but some incentive that said you have to do this sort of thing. Let's talk about um, 
the part of the system that accounts for a lot of what you do when it doesn't work. So primary health care, chronic disease management, uh, the cascade of diagnostic tests that occur, you know, the explosion in DI, the innovations, so-called innovations, well, they're innovations, but not always useful, like knee arthroscopy. If you could wave a wand, uh, what would you do to make primary health care more effective so that you actually could do less? So particularly in your medical wards, which as we know are typically full of people who are in a way the system's failures. Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, I think one of the things, and, and we've been moderately successful, we have a Somerville family health team uh, uh, in, our, um, uh, in our catchment area that we've linked actually up to our hospital directly so we've, uh, uh, they can access any of their patient information in the hospital. And, and, and that, I think, has helped a lot because they understand what's happening in the hospital and we're able to connect with, the, uh, uh, with those individuals. But, uh, I mean, I think that's, that's only one thing. I think there needs to be more focus on, on, well, first of all, I'll get back to my big bugbear. What is the strategy? What is the strategy for this province, any province, in what they want to do? So if, if, uh, if the objective is to keep people out of hospitals uh, and to do more stuff in the community, then we have to be very focused about that. So we have to say, are there clinics you can provide in the community? Is there ways in which you can do stuff that's in the hospital now that doesn't have to be, uh, uh, to be done in the hospital? Is there better ways to integrate family physicians with, uh, uh, with hospitals? Is there a need to train more family physicians? I mean, I'm always amazed that we, that we, we uh, um, have this system where essentially we give over a whole bunch of money to universities and they decide what the positions are that they're going to create in medical training, for example. So we say, well, where do we really need physicians? I mean, we need physicians, but you say, okay, we need pediatricians, we need psychiatrists, we need family physicians, we need geriatricians. So then you turn around and say, okay, well, shouldn't then that be the majority of people that are being trained in medical schools? Well, it isn't that at all. Say, well, so who makes the decision on the medical school uh, uh, allocation? Uh, now, certainly when I was in government, and it may have changed a bit, is generally that's made in the universities. It's not made uh, uh, by the government. And then you turn around and you say, well, why wouldn't people go into those specialties? And then you, first of all, there's not the training positions. But then you say, well, let's have a look at the fee schedule. Well, where are the fee schedules? Some of the lowest. They're for those, those individuals. So I'm not saying this is, this is a money-driven system, but if you're looking uh, at what your potential income, of course that's going to be a factor. And again, that, uh, uh, again, I'm speaking uh, from my days in Alberta, but we would negotiate an agreement with the AMA, and then the money would go. And then the AMA would decide the distribution of the money and the fee schedule. So you say, okay, well, now wait a minute, this is all taxpayers' money, we're moving over, uh, and yet we're not probably taking, I think uh, we, the system is not taking as, perhaps as active a role, they shouldn't say, well, if we're putting all these billions of dollars in, why shouldn't we have some say uh, in how it's actually allocated. So I, I think that, I mean, it's kind of a roundabout way of getting uh, back to some of the things that you're talking about. But when you talk about myriad of tests and all of this sort of stuff, well, it gets back to my point about integration. I mean, we've created structures. They're not going to solve it. I mean, I, I often uh, use the example of, uh, of, uh, e of IT. I know that's a, that's a deadly topic in this province. But... but um, you know, we've been, my first initiative in IT was in Alberta in the ministry in 1984. It was the first tranche of money we threw out uh, to get a, an electronic patient record. Uh, and, uh, but we, uh, we jumped in it, as most provinces do, to micromanaging the thing to death and creating all kinds of structures. If I had a wand, I'd be saying, pick a group of hospitals and say, okay, I, I expect, this is the accountability I have for you, I expect you to work with the other hospitals in your area and you pick the hospitals where you have the biggest transfer of patients between them. And I don't care how you do it, 
I don't care whether it's Cerner, whether it's IBM, whether it's Eclipsis, I don't care. But in five years, you better damn well be integrated. Uh, and you do it. Uh, I, think we, uh, I think we spend far too much time trying to micromanage everything to death rather than saying, actually, people do have an idea of what they need to do uh, and just get out of the way and let them do it. <clears throat> so I've got two more questions before we throw it okay. open to the audience. Um, your point about in some areas we micromanage to death and in other areas we don't manage at all. As you've said, we allow medical associations to divide up the pie among them with the predictable results that the cognitive work is undervalued and the hand-eye work is overvalued. Why do we do that? I know you're not a psychiatrist, no. but... <laughs> <laughs> I may need but, but one, but I'm be. not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I think it's tradition. It's tradition, and it's, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult uh, field to get into. Uh, I mean, you, you, you take on any group uh, um, uh, with a fair degree of trepidation. You have to have all your ducks in line, and I don't always think that, uh, that government has their ducks in line. And furthermore, uh, I mean, we don't have a system in this country. We've got at least 10 provinces, none of which agree with any of the others, and none of them will agree on uh, uh, organizing anything together. And I, I don't think any individual jurisdiction is going to take this on because, uh, uh, you know, particularly physicians, but they're certainly not the, own, the only professional group. This is a national resource. You cannot take this on. I mean, uh, uh, um, in Ontario, you couldn't have a, a, a province like Ontario saying to University of Toronto or Western or, or Hamilton or Ottawa that we're going to get into the business of telling you uh, your, uh, uh, you know, your distribution of uh, residency training positions or, or uh, medical education when British Columbia may say, well, now wait a second here, we draw 25% uh, uh, of those graduates come out and work in uh, uh, in British Columbia. So there has to be a collective on this, and the only collective I've ever seen this, this country really work on well in healthcare is Kai Hai. Uh, but having been involved in the first provin federal provincial committee on medical manpower, that we, we, do not, uh, we do not work well together on this stuff. So my, <clears throat> actually I have now one and a half questions to ask you, because your, your answers are so thought-provoking. Oh. Um, so look around the world uh, and, and say, well, Janet, you, you, you've got one more job, and it is to head, <laughs> it is to be the CEO of the system in the world that you admire the most. It could be a subsystem. You know, it could be Mayo, it could be Kaiser, it could be someplace in Sweden. Oh, yeah. Who do you think's done it right? Who would you love to be like? Oh, geez. I, I think we spend too much time looking around the world thinking we're going to pick one that's going to do it for us because they're all so different. Uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, uh, for instance, some of the Nordic countries, uh, uh, Sweden and Denmark, have done some absolutely wonderful things. Uh, but they have a tax system, which is not overly, I'm not overly enamored with. Uh, if you look at some of the, I mean, there are wonderful systems in the U.S. You look at Intermountain, uh, you look at uh, Kaiser, unbelievable uh, uh, what they've, uh, they've been able to do. Look at some of the stuff Australia uh, has been able to do. So I don't think they're, if I could kind of pull little bits of those together, uh, I think it would be great. But I'd rather, I'd rather stand for the possibility that, that uh, co working collectively, we can actually make this system the one that we, uh, uh, that we want and is the best in the world. Well, that's rather optimistic given your diagnosis of our traditions in history, but <laughs> consistency is not required. So, so my last question is, this will, the introductory part is fairly obvious, you're a woman, <laughs> and, <laughs> at least since the operation. <laughs> now, so the GTA, the GTA has been an innovator in a sense. You've got a concentration of female CEOs in large hospitals here. Uh, probably could be unique in the world for all I know. Let's say it is. No one's here to tell us it isn't. <laughs> tell me what difference you think it makes to leadership style. Tell me whether you think, you know, the, does gender matter? And, and if so, how? 
Uh, well, those of you who uh, listened to the, um, the luncheon that um, there was uh, Mary Jo Haddad and uh, myself and um, um, no, it was uh, Catherine Zahn. Um, we, uh, we were on a panel and asked to speak on the issue of gender and refused and said we, uh, we really want to talk about leadership. Uh, I mean, you're right, I think there's no doubt there's a lot of uh, women leaders now in Ontario, but I'll have to tell you, it's interesting that uh, a couple of years ago, if you looked around the country, uh, the, the women leadership was bigger outside of this province. The biggest systems in the country, Sheila Wetherill in, uh, in Edmonton, uh, Linda Cranston in, uh, in the PHSA in British Columbia, Ida Goodrow in Vancouver, uh, um, uh, Maura Davies in uh, Saskatoon, uh, down in QE2, look at Eastern Newfoundland, uh, big, big, huge systems, women, not in this province, not in this province. Uh, uh, but I think uh, uh, my view would be is that, I mean, women represent slightly more than 50% of the population. It does not serve you well not to have that group uh, in, uh, uh, in leadership roles. Uh, and so I think, particularly if you look at the fact that the overwhelming majority of people who work in healthcare are women. So having that perspective, I think, is, uh, uh, is an important one. But I would say that it's, it's, it's got to be leadership. If you turn around and try to put it on the basis of gender, I, I don't think we get anywhere in that discussion, quite frankly. And I'm, I'm not a big proponent of it. I'd rather have uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, say, uh, about me, well, there's a lot of things I'd like them to say about me, but I'd, uh, I'm sure they do. But, I, but I'd like them to say about me is that she made a difference uh, because she was a good leader, not because, well, you know, she was a woman or she got this because she was a woman. I just don't think it serves us well and it's too easy to, uh, to drop to that sort of a... a it, well, indeed, but beyond, beyond the yeah. notion of a quota yeah. or something, yeah. but it, 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 does it make a difference to the leadership style? Do you think... Could you tell if you if we had a, if we blinded everybody's gender in Canadian healthcare and then you looked at how they communicate, yeah. what they focus on? A lot of the of the of the women chief execs have been nurses, you know, yeah. which obviously brings a different perspective than people who have an MBA or people who are physicians or something. So, is is there a qualitative difference that? Well, if you look at some of the research liter literature, uh, uh, you know, he said, she said, and some of the, the there, there is some, I guess, some uh, uh, gender uh, differences in the way people think and the way they communicate. Uh, but, but I think, again, as I said, it's more on leadership. I think, though, you put your finger on a point, a lot of the, uh, the women uh, leaders are nurses. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's the same way saying there's a number of uh, women of uh, of uh, uh, leaders who are doctors. It's representative of the population of the people who are working in the, uh, uh, in the field. I think it would, be pretty, uh, 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 it, it would be pretty unreasonable to say that you wouldn't have nurses, uh, some nurses leading the system when they're by far the overwhelming majority of employees in the system. Great. Thank you. So Anton, have you got the roving mic? So the, the floor is now yours, and Anton will, will because he's... Stephen, I'll, I'll also remind you that Janet, of course, is Madam Fixit for the province when people are in trouble. Uh, she is vice chair of the Ontario Hospital Association this year and will be the chair next year. So more power to her, I guess, is what I would suggest, or we could look for that. Who's got some <laughs> questions for Janet? Okay, I guess we've answered everything. Oh, no, here There's we go. There's a bunch here. And one. Right, we're going to go home early. Good morning, and thank you, uh, Janet. Um, I'm from William Mosler Health System, so another community hospital. Um, in that sector, we uh, you know, you talked about some of the terms that we use to define the different sectors and um, components of our system, and one of the things that I find we often say in the community sector is that we say, or in community hospitals, is we can't be all things to all people anymore. We use that phrase. So from a strategy standpoint, and as you said, if we, if we look back and think, what should our strategy be? What would you say that we should be? What should a community hospital be? If we're not going to be all things to all people, what would you message to your community that, the, that your organization is? 
Well, it's a good question because we actually went through that discussion uh, when we did our strategic plan. Uh, and, and the thing we came up with was uh, hospitals, by and large now, do not differentiate themselves on the basis of what they do. And now, there may be to say, okay, you're the heart center in this or you're the something in this. Uh, but by and large, if you really want to make a difference, you make it on how you do your work. Uh, it's, it's not uh, what you do. I mean, I, th I think it's too easy to say we can't be all things to all people. We often create that expectation in the, in the community. Uh, and I think there's a lot of things that hospitals do is say, well, they don't actually need to be done in hospital anymore. If we actually work with agencies, that, that stuff can be done elsewhere. So it's, it's too easy, I think, uh, uh, an out to say we can't be all things to all people and, and then try to focus on a few things. I mean, I, I say to our people, uh, we, uh, uh, we may not be able to serve everybody in the community. We may not be able to do that. But anybody who comes in our door has to get and deserves the best quality that we are absolutely capable of giving. Uh, and you have, I think you really have to focus on that. Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm going to cheat a bit and, and uh, ask this question to Stephen, albeit <laughs> I know that he's shy and uh, <laughs> um, We are talking about community hospitals, and we have a whole lot of community hospitals that are <coughs> much smaller than Janice, yeah. whether they're in Strathroy or uh, communities of 10, 15,000, um, where the public still regard them as hospitals. They, have, they should have everything, they should do everything, when in fact they're not doing and can't do uh, and provide these services. So how would you see them being restructured? Or how do you see making use of that resource in a way that's more relevant with the trends today? And I'm asking you because uh, presumably Saskatchewan being uh, an area where this uh, uh, seemed to start. I, I'm just interested in what your thoughts might be on that. Well, <coughs> here's what Janet would say. <laughs> uh, you know, it, my province isn't much of an example because while we closed 52 hospitals, their collective average daily census was 200. So these were places where literally some of them had four beds, some of them had I think the biggest one that closed had let fewer than 20 beds. And 15,000, a town of 15,000 in Saskatchewan without a hospital, are you out of your mind? <laughs> so it's an entirely different thing. But I would say it's form follows function. I mean, if you can have a critical mass of general surgeons, you know, the core specialties, psychiatry, general surgery, radio, you know, the ones where you do the bread and butter surgical work and where you need to in a hospital medical care, they may indeed be cheaper and they are closer to home and they can do stuff. I mean, the literature is fairly clear. Some surgery uh, can be done in quite small facilities quite well. So you have to, I think, define what the nature of your problem is. If the problem is you have too much capacity, you've got to get it out of there. And whether you get it out of there by closing facilities and causing a riot in your community. I mean, I get the OHA clips, so I see the discourse in your small town papers. It's pretty vicious, you know, so it's, it's, it's politically extraordinarily difficult. So I would drive it on a, on a quality and safety agenda first and an efficiency agenda second. It's hard to have an efficiency conversation with the public, maybe easier now with the fiscal challenges, especially in Ontario, but it is really hard. But I will say on your worst day, you don't have the problem of institutions that cannot function on any level as a hospital compared to what we had. So in, in that sense, you're kind of better off. And the other thing that you don't want to do, I would say, and I speak where, from a province where the biggest city is 220,000, so. But you, when, when you start decanting work upward to very large facilities and academic health science centers, you create two kinds of problems that you don't need. They are, despite anyone's best effort, high cost places. And they have difficulty achieving efficiencies. And sometimes it's pretty daunting and inconvenient for the public and patients. Just simple things like parking and how do you navigate the incredibly complicated environments. So uh, I, I think um, if you're going to make headway, you have to do it at the community level. And again, no one has succeeded in having communities identify more with the front end of the system than the back end of the system, which includes long-term residential care as well. And uh, all I can say is 
good luck to you and better luck to you than we've had because when Saskatchewan closed the 52 hospitals, this is an oversimplification, but it changed the political landscape of the province probably forever. It created an urban-rural divide that persists to this day. Um, Janet, the question I'd like to ask you is, um, to what extent in your leadership role and your hospital, do you make your plans thinking about the health needs of the community specifically? And to what extent do you see yourself as a leader for, the, for Mississauga? I mean, such a large, complex community. Do you really, could you talk about your role in leading that community's health? Uh, well, I mean, simplistically, yes, I can say we do. Uh, uh, for instance, when we developed our strategic plan, we, uh, we really looked uh, very carefully at what the demographic patterns were in our community. Uh, so, for example, we have a large South Asian community uh, within Mississauga. That drives quite a different planning strategy for cardiac. They have a very high incidence of cardiac disease in the South Asian population. So we had to plan, okay, we're actually seeing increases in our cardiac program, which may not be the same. Uh, 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 the same elsewhere. We have a lot of new immigrants uh, who have some real separation challenges, so what do we need to do with our community mental health programs? That's just a couple of examples. Uh, but we, uh, we were pretty uh, aggressive about that. We also did bring in uh, 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 Colin Pereira to do some more detailed work on, uh, on uh, HBAM to, to really start to look at not just what what the demographic patterns were, but then bringing in some uh, uh, clinician panels uh, about where did we think the, the system was going. So for instance, if you talk about, well, I don't know, any type of a disease, what do we expect it to be like in the future? Because certainly our clinicians have a lot better information about that than we do. So do you see this, uh, are we going to see more aggressive surgical treatments? Uh, are we going to see better survival rates? Are we going to see different modalities so that people can be in the community? Those sorts of things. So we spent a fair bit of time and, and uh, certainly I think based on my experience in both Alberta and, uh, uh, and British Columbia, I provided some leadership there because of course we had a responsibility in the regional authorities there uh, to be looking at how do you manage the entire population and reporting to the communities on the health of the population, not just the sickness of it. So say, you know, we had objectives around in, in Vancouver, uh, you know, on low infant birth weight mo uh, mothers. We had uh, objectives around uh, looking at increasing uh, uh, exercise, uh, reducing smoking, uh, better in, Van in Edmonton, uh, better feeding programs for kids in primary school, all of those sorts of things. So I think those are, uh, uh, those are important uh, uh, things to do. The challenge, I think we still, uh, well, we obviously have we have those going forward, but is to um, is to try and and link it to where we're going as a province. I mean, I was saying to Stephen earlier, what is the strategy for Ontario? Can somebody tell me what the health strategy is? I don't mean the sickness strategy because our system is primarily a sickness strategy. What is the health strategy? And I look at and I often give an example. Um, uh, I'll say to somebody, okay, well, tell me what one of the strategies is for Ontario. And they'll say chronic disease. I'll say, well, that makes sense. Chronic disease is rising. What, what, are, what are we going to do about chronic disease? Well, diabetes. Well, it's good. I mean, diabetes uh, uh, has really increased tremendously. So what, what are we doing about uh, diabetes? What's our big, huge initiative in diabetes? Uh, we're creating a registry. I'll say, uh, okay, now let me understand this. We've gone from chronic disease to a disease to a registry. Not that I'm saying a registry isn't important, but all of a sudden we've hung it on the registry and say, well, wait a minute, if diabetes is an issue, and God knows it is, well, uh, can you explain to me why we dump participation, uh, why we allow junk foods in schools, while gym classes are now pretty much gone the way of the dodo? Uh, uh, why we, uh, uh, we don't look at some more of these, uh, uh, these important things. So it's uh, uh, without, without a strategy, uh, a clearly defined strategy on health, I think some of the things that, uh, well, the implicit in the question you're asking, becomes very difficult to know what exactly we're trying to do. Dr. Denneman from Kids. 
can you take that a little further? If where the rubber hits the road between the community and serious health care is at the community hospital level, yeah. and we know that social determinants of health are amazingly important, and we know that social inequality and income inequality is very important, and we, we, know, we know all these things, and yet, as an aside, you, you, you sort of say Sweden, Denmark, Norway are fantastic systems, but we can't afford the tax that goes along with it. Um, what's the role of the community hospitals in trying to change the system and playing an important role in some of these important social determinants of health? Well, I think it is uh, uh, important. I mean, for example, when I was at East General, we got a, we got a group together uh, in uh, um, uh, southeast Toronto and said, let's take a social determinants of health approach uh, and let's identify two or three things that we're going to actually try to make a difference on. Uh, and so we identified uh, air quality, we identified housing uh, as two of two of them. And so we brought a group together and we actually talked. I mean, the hospital itself, uh, East General's a, a, a good community hospital, we said we, have, we don't have the main role in here, but one of the things we do have is being the big, one of the biggest employers in East Toronto, we do have a lot of clout. Uh, and so we can actually stand behind others and advocate for things that are important. So we picked a few things and we started to look at, okay, what sort of low-income housing do we have in, uh, uh, in southeast Toronto? Are there things like uh, 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 feeding programs for kids? Uh, so I think there are some things that, uh, uh, that we can do. The challenge that we have is it, it is a very difficult thing to move money around in this system. And I, I give the example, when I was in Alberta, prior to regionalization, I was at the university hospital. So I would fight to the death for the liver transplant program. That was it, you know, more money, more liver transplants. Not that they aren't important. <laughs> well, <laughs> but after regionalization, I came back to the university hospital and I was in a, in a regional system. And so we're talking about the money we've got and what we're going to do. And we were taking, Alberta at the time was quite innovative in, in looking at a, uh, a population uh, a health approach to health care. And uh, we got to a discussion around the table about saying, okay, for the, for the, the money that, that we might be able to get for one or two liver transplants, we can actually put together a school feeding program uh, in West Edmonton. And that program, we know the results are very clear. You, f you give the kids one good meal a day, they have a better, well, you would know, uh, 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 better educational outcomes, better, better education, uh, have better incomes, they're healthier, all of that stuff that the Brits what, published in the early 1900s. Uh, and uh, well, we it were- It takes time, Janet, come on. <laughs> Well, we could, uh, in a flash, it was all our money, the region's money, we just moved it around and that's what we did. Uh, but to try and do those things in this province right now, even with LINS, is very difficult to do. Dr. Michael Reckless. Oh. Hold on, Michael. There it goes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your conversation this morning. Um, the last few, uh, few points sort of remind me of um, some work I did in this province that yeah. was a bit discouraging looking at public health. Um, and the rest of the health system. So we've been talking about public health very much the last few minutes, um, but could you comment on what you think the role of public health is in regionalized systems and the obvious stark difference between Ontario where public health is not involved and, uh, and, and, and even informally the connections are often not yeah. that strong versus um, Alberta or British Columbia which have integrated public health. Oh, well, I think it has to be an integral part. In fact, this is one of the things that drives me bananas here uh, with H1N1 and now more recently with, uh, uh, with this flu, uh, the fact that, the, that public health is separate. Uh, I mean, one, they, uh, uh, certainly in my experience in Alberta and British Columbia, uh, they, do, they do provide a perspective that we just don't have. That's not our, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's generally not something that we have that uh, knowledge and skills about, uh, but you you can't if we if we're going to talk about about creating a system where people are actually healthier uh, and we're focused on their health. You cannot have that system if you don't have public health in it. That's what their that's that's what their uh, uh, their key set of skills and uh, uh, and knowledge is. And so to think that we can sit around a table, we 
uh, some of the more traditional players and think that we can organize a system and we'll bring in uh, 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 public health when we think about it makes no sense. And the example I would use right now is all the C. diff. I mean, I look at our, at our own hospital, for example, the amount of a community acquired C. diff I mean, I'm reading some of the press last week about looking at St. Joe's in, in Hamilton and the number of, of patients that were community acquired a C. diff. We, we hospitals aren't, aren't uh, uh, dealing with, well, they're dealing with the results of it, but you have to have public health. Uh, you have to have your community physicians. You have to all of that involved in trying to uh, uh, resolve this. And I think the way it's currently structured, we're not going to solve that problem. Any last question? Yeah, just a question on leadership. Um, what you've illustrated this morning, I think, is through a illustrious career, the, the challenges facing hospital CEOs get ever greater. The complexity, the pace, uh, the accountability. Um, but just uh, a last thought on tomorrow and the next generation, because succession planning feels to be something that's sadly missing. Um, and where are tomorrow's generation of CEOs going to come from, do you think? Uh, well, I, I, I would say it's not just hospital CEOs. I mean, a, a large portion of my experience has been in, uh, in regional systems uh, where we went beyond a, a hospital. I think leadership in the healthcare system is going to be increasingly challenged. And, uh, uh, and why? I mean, I often describe the healthcare system in Canada. There's three up things about healthcare in Canada. One, it's the single biggest expenditure by governments, which represents a, a big commitment. Number two, everybody's interested in it. And three, it's a defining characteristic of being Canadian. There's three downsides to the Canadian system. It's the single biggest expenditure by governments, uh, and it goes on. The, the environment is so both big P and small p political, uh, that, that you, you need a skill set that is, a, is very pragmatic. Uh, you need to be able to deal with a lot of ambiguity, a lot of ambiguity, much more complex environments. Uh, 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 certainly uh, uh, when I started out, uh, it was much simpler than it is, uh, uh, it is now. And I think having a really good understanding of of an appreciation for the fact that the system itself is a people system. It is all about relationships. Uh, I sometimes, and I've, uh, I see some of my own people here, I harangue about this one. We can get lost in the technologies and the processes and the forms, God knows there's enough forms, uh, and reporting, uh, and the equipment, and the buildings. But essentially, healthcare is a people business. I mean. Come on, folks, if there weren't any patients, there wouldn't be any system. And it is all about relationships. If I think about 99% of the letters I get that complain about something, it is not about, well, the MRI was making more noise than I wanted it to make, uh, or the lab equipment didn't look as clean as I thought it was. It's about, you know, uh, uh, Nurse Nancy or Dr. So-and-so uh, treated me shabbily. They didn't speak to me in a respectful way. Somebody didn't do this, somebody didn't do that. So I think the need for outstanding people skills is going to be more and more important. The final thing I would say is understanding the importance of evidence more than ever before, really understanding what it is and what it isn't, because you can get BS pretty quickly uh, with a bunch of reports that actually aren't telling you uh, uh, too much. Stephen and Janet, this is the big test. Did we appreciate this conversation? <laughs> So uh, February has been reserved for three uh, politicians. Uh, the minister uh, has been invited, Mr. Hudak has been invited, and the premier has been invited. None of them have confirmed anything, so watch, <laughs> watch my notes. But come the next month for sure, we have a conversation with Stephen Lewis, only because he did well today, and Saad Rafi. Those two have not met. They've spoken on the phone, and I've got to tell you, it will be a very interesting conversation. 
So that's coming in March. Janet, thank you very much. There's a contribution going to Trillium. It's small. And there's a contribution going to West 20, I believe it. Which Station 21. Station 21. Sorry, I was close. Station 20 West. Station 20 West. West. Did I get it? Yes. yes, we did. Takes care of feeding those who are less fortunate than certain of the people in this audience. And uh, we appreciate it. It's a small donation on behalf of our sponsors. Thank you for coming to breakfast with the Chiefs.